If you can make your way to your seats, please, I'm going to try and kiss. Can you please make your way to your seats? Hmm. Are we ready? We're live. All right. So, <laughs> thank you, Karen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I want to um, um, tell you a story, actually. On, on December 7th of last year, I uh, saw a tweet come by um, that was an article um, by uh, James Lang in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it was like gushing and raving over um, a book that was called um, um, Educating Minds Online or um, Minds Online, something like that. But that was the title of the, the article. And you can Google it. It was December 8th in the, in the, in the Chronicle. And um, I invite you to read that article. Because immediately after reading that article, I Googled Michelle Miller. And I immediately Googled Michelle Miller plus email. And I immediately emailed her and asked her if she would come to the summit and, uh, and present for us. Um, I am so excited that she uh, was able to come from sunny Arizona um, to, to visit us here in sunny Syracuse in February. Um, I, I um, had had the good fortune of hearing the Brain Rules guy talk at OLC this past year. And um, previously at ELI, like two or three years ago, I heard another cognitive psychologist or, or a, um, a, a neuropsychologist talking. Um, and I can't remember her name. I wish I had looked it up, but I can't remember her name. In any case, I, I have wanted to bring um, uh, um, a, a brain scientist here to talk with us about uh, learning and the brain for some time. And I w was just looking and waiting for Michelle. Um, <laughs> and so let me tell you a little bit about her. She's the director of first year of the first year learning initiative and professor of psychological sciences at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. Uh, she is a cognitive psychologist whose research focuses on memory and attention, psychological impacts of technology, and student academic success. Uh, at Northern Arizona University, she's uh, shaped redesign programs, including that first year initiative that I mis mentioned and the President's Technology Initiative. She has written extensively and presented on pedagogy and course design, and she is the author of Minds Online, Teaching Effectively with Technology, which was just published uh, in 2014, um, uh, like I said, at the end of 2014 by Harvard University uh, Press. Uh, she specializes in mobilizing faculty to adopt teaching strategies that leverage principles from cognitive and brain science sciences to create more effective and engaging learning experiences. And I'm so thrilled that she's here to talk with us today. Oh, let me show you her book. <laughs> thank you, Michelle, for being here. All right. Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction, all your hospitality. I mean, what an honor to be included. Um, in a lineup such as we've been treated uh, to today and will continue to be for the rest of this experience, right? So, as Alex mentioned, I, I'm a cognitive psychologist by training. Um, you know, it's the area that focuses on how we take in and process and use information. And, you know, so my perspective on the issues we've all been grappling with in a spirited way today um, is going to overlap with some of the speakers and other thinkers that we have here. And it overlaps very little with some of the others. And so I'm hoping that we'll all find some value in some of the diversity of perspectives, um, including some of the ideas that, that I'm going to try to present today. Um, you know, a lot of what I'm going to try to lead us through today is uh, going to be bringing it back home to you know, what we can do locally with what we have um, at our disposal. Um, it's going to you know, recognize that a lot of us are in the space of working with faculty to um, mobilize, persuade, uh, open minds a little bit to some, uh, some alternative means for doing what we do. Uh, I, being an instructional designer is outside my world. Um, however, I'm a big admirer uh, and have kind of been watching this, this field gain steam and seeing how it complements so much of what we can do at our learning institutions. 
So I'm coming at it from that perspective as well. Uh, those of you who are faculty, I, say, I, I hope that you find some things that you can implement right away um, and use to start making some of your choices in your instructional designs yourself and maybe to also talk to the colleagues of yours who are not like an event, who are not at an event like this, right? The colleagues who need to hear a few other alternatives and other ideas. Um, all right, so you know, I came to this uh, line of inquiry, you know, after really focusing a lot of uh, much of my early career on you know the more theoretical stuff on research and memory, uh, attention, a lot of stuff on language. But as I um, uh, began to work at an institution that is deeply committed to teaching as its mission, and got deeper into that world myself, and started having more contact with the new, what was then at least, the new modalities of teaching and learning uh, through online, through uh, computer-assisted instruction, and so forth. The more I got interested in these questions, uh, just the, the real hands-on questions of how do we adapt some of this stuff to help guide what we do and help push learning out to the, to the furthest reaches of where it can with our students. This is, as you know already today, not a new idea at all. Um, all the lies adopted it a long time ago. Uh, you hear calls all the time to take our teaching and our learning designs and base them more in cognitive science and uh, related disciplines like neuroscience. And we've made some exciting strides in this and we've built awareness of some basic principles, but I still see that a lot gets lost in translation. You know, as we go from, from theory uh, to ideas about what we should do to what people are actually doing out on the front lines. And that's what I was, what I've been hoping to address, right? So, uh, you know, stepping into that gap between you know, what we know about the mind, that literally thousands of research projects that come out every single year, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And, you know, I would place a lot of the responsibility for this lost in translation problem with, on my side, on the research side. Because we don't make it easy as specialists in the discipline for even other specialists in the discipline to pick out from those thousands and thousands of findings what's important, what actually relates to the teaching and the learning designs that we, that we actually do. So, you know, the book is one uh, modest attempt to help begin to address that gap and draw people into this uh, cognitive side of learning. Um, so what I'm hoping to share with you today, I first want to kind of focus on two big areas within cognition and the science of cognition that I do feel are the most relevant to us as teachers. All right, so there's going to be kind of a piece on memory and attention, and there's going to be another piece on what we call kind of the higher thought processes, the reasoning side, the skills and, and problem solving side. So we're going to pick some highlights uh, from each one of those. And here's what, here's what I want to try to, to carry through for you. Um, so for each one of these, I'm going to be highlighting some key principles, basic tape home stuff that I think really all instructional designers, faculty, uh, administrators in my ideal world would all know, that we would all take to heart. And I want to try to demonstrate a few of these. So there'll be you know, a, a little bit of, of show as well as, as tell included here. Um, I want to boil these down into uh, principles, very simple heuristics or shortcuts that we can use as we do select from all the different things and technologies we have to choose from. Um, because here too, the, the, the problem is not options, it's not lack of things we can do to enhance, to teach, to, and so forth. It's which ones do we choose. And in between those, I do also really want to hammer on um, what the technology buys us, because I think that that is one important aspect of mobilizing faculty and staying focused on what we really want to do. Because after all, technology is not really free, right? Even if you don't actually have to write a check to purchase a technology, there's still the cost of setting it up, maintaining it, uh, push back from students sometimes. So I think it really helps to have that in our hip pocket at all times of this is what this affords us that we don't have with quote unquote traditional teaching methods alone, right? So keeping it concrete, keeping it practical, and uh, wrapping it up with a few big closing thoughts, because after all, this type of event, this event here, is clearly about some of the big picture ideas that we want to we want to take home. All right, so if we are going to start anywhere with you know, cognitive science, cognitive principles, kind of makes sense to start with a couple of 
big grounding principles in memory. Okay? Now, I don't want us to get off to you know bad start here, get off on the wrong foot, and imply that memory and you know mere memorization is the sole aim of what we do. Okay? Uh, nobody is claiming that. However, I, I do believe, and I've come to believe very strongly, that building a knowledge base of you know, information, of facts, of concepts in an area is okay as part of what we do, as part of, what, uh, part of teaching and learning. Right? So uh, while memorization is it's something we should all bristle at, at the idea of we're just out there to help students memorize, uh, it's not a dirty word to talk about the building knowledge. All right, so just putting that straight out there. And there is a little bit of, of work that's coming out right now um, in the study of, of STEM learning in particular that talks about how it's, it's really kind of a false choice between do you want students to remember information or do you want them to be able to think. These two things can complement one another. And there is a little bit of research that's starting to come out that's showing the better that you have mastered um, some knowledge, some basic knowledge in an area, the better you are able to make those conceptual leaps that we all want our students ultimately to be able to do. So hopefully we can kind of make our peace with that uh, right off the bat. Um, all right, so what should all teachers know when it comes to memory? Now there was a time pretty long ago in memory research when we thought about memory as a series of components that pass information back and forth to one another and some little bit of it gets encoded or put into a more permanent form that you can get back later, right? And this was, had great physical metaphors, almost like an assembly line. So information comes in from your senses, most of it's gone, it goes into this short-term memory component, and there's a whole lot of research on this, um, where if you, especially if you cycled it around, research, uh, rehearsed it a, a whole lot, it might be lucky enough to get passed over to long-term memory, which was this sort of big storage area where you could go back in and pull what you need and take it, uh, put it back into short-term memory. All right, so as you can probably guess, all right, nobody really <laughs> believes this about memory anymore. You still see some echoes of it, by the way, in, in you know, different uh, books and so forth that talk about the science of learning and how memory works. Um, but this is one big take home message for all teachers. Okay, we, know, we know now that, for example, you don't have to put information in this short term store and cycle it around, um, and that the short term memory store um, is a lot more complex and works differently than we once, we once imagined. Now, the problem is this wasn't replaced by one single theory of memory that covers the whole thing and fits really nicely on a PowerPoint slide and has this nice physical metaphor that we can all grasp. So I can't give you that. The modern day uh, study of memory has, you know, in a sense splintered into a lot of different specialty areas, but we've made a lot of progress. So we don't have a nice slide anymore, but we do have a grasp on a couple of key things that I do think um, are relevant and relate to what we do and helping our students build up their knowledge. So when you look at how a, a modern day memory scientist looks at this sort of knowledge acquisition and memory, memory issue, one of the big things that comes out, uh, big themes, is this kind of sea change in how we started to look at, well, a lot of processes, but including memory. And this change had to do with, instead of just saying, okay, uh, memory is this thing whose purpose is to hold information and save it. To say, no, memory's purpose is, is part of just a lot of systems in your mind that are there to help you survive in your environment. Okay? You kind of call this a functionalist view or an adaptive memory view. I think those are two, two words that I, I think describe this mindset pretty well. So, you know, in this sense, you understand a memory a whole lot better, why we remember some things and forget others, if you think about what is memory there to do? Why is it there taking up valuable real estate in your brain, if not to do these things? So, uh, among other things, this really focuses us on the fact that goal relevance really drives a lot of memory. Okay, we're not just taking in information because it's there and we might need it. We're a lot more selective than that, and we're very, very driven by what am I trying to get out of this, all right? Um, now, that short-term memory component, that little box in the middle that was originally the subject of so much interest, um, 
Well, that's uh, largely been, I guess you could say it's been replaced by this concept of working memory. That's also a concept that's been around for a very, very long time. But I would argue it's still a current one, still going strong. And here are some of the key uh, nuances are that, you know, with working memory, it's not just you have this one component that holds information in the here and now. You have a series of systems that work together to hold information that you're using it in the present or that you're trying to encode in a more permanent form. All right? So for example, um, just in the arena of verbal processing, you've got a couple of components that hold different aspects of, of verbal information, just for the short term. You've got one that holds visual spatial information. So these uh, collaborate together to, to hold what you need in the here and now. We also have to put a little asterisk on this and say that you know a lot of um, what you take in does not have to really hang around in working memory. Working memory is really good for holding on to different pieces of information that are kind of disjointed. Okay, so if some weird psychologist has asked me to remember uh, a list of uh, I don't know random words, well, I'm going to need a lot of working memory for that. If I am simultaneously trying to listen to instructions that the, uh, the teacher is giving me and figure out how to do this on my iPad and read some other instructions elsewhere, I'm going to need a lot of working memory to juggle those things. But to do something like take in connected discourse, ideas that fit together, you don't necessarily have to hang on to it in a storage area. Right? You're probably going to interpret it right away. And if you're going to remember it, you're going to remember it in a conceptual form that you store right away. So, uh, you know, and then there's this little factoid, 7 plus or minus 1. How many people have ever heard of that? You can hold 7 plus or minus 1 pieces in, in, in working memory. Well, uh, we know now that this is, this is uh, not exactly true either. So with more sophisticated ways of actually tapping how many pieces of information can people really hold at a time, uh, we now would place it more around 4. <laughs> And there's also an emerging school of thought I think is really interesting that says that working memory is essentially inseparable from what we would call attention. So how many things can you pay attention to at once? I want to give an estimate. One. <laughs> One. Yeah, so we've gone from like, ooh, you know, eight or nine if we're, if we're doing well to eh, maybe four to one. Um, and you know, I think this is, this is good to at least have some perspective on this, because I have occasionally seen advice to teachers that say, you know, if you put seven things on a PowerPoint slide roughly, that'll fit in working memory. <laughs> and it's, it's like wrong on so many levels. Uh, so that's a good one for us all to take home. And yeah, so this uh, working memory um, encoding and attention relationship, I think is one of the most intriguing things to be unfolding in fairly recent uh, research on memory. And I, I think for teachers, um, especially those who are experimenting with and pushing the boundaries out into new ways of teaching and learning, just to know that this is the entry point. If you don't have attention, you really don't have very much. So this is a you know intentionally uh, provocative idea, but yeah, attention is uh, the key, uh, the driver, however you want to call it, of attention. And I think a dramatic demonstration of this can be found uh, with all the different ways you can play around with, what do you really remember in the absence of focused attention, all right? Um, and so there's, there's a lot of these different demonstrations. Um, I'm going to go with one. You may have seen um, this type of effect before, but it uh, usually works with new stimuli either way. I'm not going to tell you too much more about it before we jump in. I actually have to exit and go to a little DVD here, um, other than to credit some of the individuals who um, have, have made some of the best demonstrations of this and done some of the research. So let's see. Tempting fate here. We're going to be juggling a couple different technologies all at once. All right. So yeah, I think I'm going to show you before I tell you too much about this. It's called the Flickr test on here. It's just another name. Um, what you're going to be seeing um, are just pictures. Right? But really, in, in actual fact, what you're going to be seeing is pairs of pictures. And across the, each version of the picture that you'll be seeing, there is some big change to the picture. Right? So it's not something microscopic, something that takes up a good chunk of the frame. Um, your job is to spot the change. All right? Now the catch is that there is a little flicker in the middle. And that's not a, a glitch. 
It's actually pretty precisely constructed to have that. And one account of what this flicker does is it disrupts your attention. It doesn't feel like much at all, but um, you'll see that it can have some dramatic effects. So I'm going to show you a couple of these examples. Some of you will see some of these right away. It actually doesn't say anything about you as an individual. It's just kind of a random variation that occurs. Um, and no spoilers, I guess. <laughs> Go ahead and raise your hand when you, when you see it so we get a sense of how it unfolds across the room. But don't, you know, yell it out. Um, okay, so here we go. That just shows you where to look, that cross. How many people see the change? Okay. Okay. Let, I know. Let's. Here is it. Here it is without the flicker. <laughs> so when you can maintain focused attention, one account of this is that you can you can are able to encode the infor, you know able to hold under the information. But without that, it's gone. Very very little remains. Let's try another. You know, there's nothing funny about just that one picture. Right? For those of you who never saw it. <laughs> All right, so as promised, they're not teeny tiny little, little changes, right? However, uh, there is another catch about uh, what makes certain changes subject to change blindness um, and other changes nearly impervious to it. And that has to do with the central interest of the picture. So people who work with this effect have found out that elements that are part of the central interest mm -hmm. will jump out right away, distraction or no. And it's not because they're in the middle or anything like that. They have to do with what the picture is about. So if it's part of the theme of the picture, the thought is you'll examine that, apply some focused attention to it, and what do you know, you won't experience that effect. So, you know, as you might be sensing, there are, uh, we're still debating and people are still researching exactly what causes this, this effect to arise. But I think it is a good demonstration. In fact, you can use this one with your students, too, if you like, because it's really robust. You don't need, you know, very special equipment to, to show it or anything. Um, to kind of show how little we take in without attention and how limited our insight is about just how much attention we have to go around. And, very broad moral to the story here is it feeds into this idea that when we direct attention towards things, that's what's useful. That's what drives encoding. Passive exposure is nearly useless. And you know, for another uh, nearly bomb-proof demonstration of this that you can use in a, in a group setting, we won't do it today, but you can do this with your students. Um, it's a replication of a classic uh, research study from 1979 that asked people to produce their memory of a very, very common object they see on a daily basis. So what you do is you ask people to draw a penny. And that's awesome because they usually have an example right on them that they can use to check right away. And I've done this with probably around 1,000 students at this point. And I've never had anybody have any, be able to replicate anything approaching um, an actual accurate drawing of a penny. Why? Because a, lot, a myriad of reasons. One of them is we've never really worked on um, attending to, thinking about, rehearsing those details, um, and also because it's not ter tremendously goal relevant, is it? My students always wave their hands and say, I don't care about pennies. Well, exactly, that's the point. And yet, when they go to study, and if you ask them their folk theories of why they remember some things and forget others, that's exactly what you get. You get, well, I remember things that I've seen a lot. Right? When I re-expose myself to information, I remember it. And we know, and you can, with a couple of, of demonstrations, show that that is not true. So here is an effect, especially effective form of practice. And how many people here have heard of the testing effect? It usually just goes by that name, right? So a few of you. Um, and this is one that is starting to make its way out there. And I, I think that's wonderful, because I think this is one of the biggest contributions that applied memory researchers have made um, to, the, to teaching and learning. So, Tests and test-like activities are a really great way to practice information in terms of giving a payoff 
uh, for time invested. So in terms of the time you invest, anything that's a self quiz, uh, a low stakes quiz, an online quiz, a pencil paper quiz, if it looks like a test and walks like a test, it will give you better memory return uh, than virtually anything else you can do. Uh, now, this is very fraught because of all the drama around high stakes testing that goes on in K through 12. Um, so if you need to reframe it around, you know, call it retrieval practice if you like, um, or, or anything else, it doesn't have to have that aspect to it, the high stakes, oh my God, stress aspect. Um, but it's a, it's a mindset set shift, right? To start thinking of tests as a way to progress towards learning goals, not I sit you down at the end and measure what you know. And once we teachers, and we can get our students on board with this as well, uh, we can start to take advantage of this. So we can master that foundational stuff and move on to the other things. Uh, some other very powerful um, applied memory findings that all teachers should know about, of course, is spacing. Right? So we know from decades of research at this point that if you say got four hours to study for uh, an assessment, uh, you're better off splitting that up into, I don't know, four one-hour sessions or eight half-hour sessions and spreading it over time. Um, many students don't do this. On the other hand, it's kind of good news for students who maybe are not traditional and do not have that ability to spend all Tuesday at the library in the big classic cram session. Um, and from a memory standpoint, it's okay to take your learning to go to your kid's soccer practice or on the way to your, to your job. And we're actually starting to learn some exciting new things, even though this is a very old effect. We're starting to learn some new things as well about the neural basis for this. So, uh, for example, we know that for verbal materials, um, when you space out practice sessions or study sessions, um, it produces a pattern of more, I guess I'd call it more concentrated and intensive <coughs> neural activity associated with the encoding of that material. Um, with, uh, other studies have shown that uh, what it may also be doing is reversing a, sort of a suppression effect that the brain induces when you see the same stimulus over and over and over. Kind of damps that down, and when you space, you release yourself from that suppression. So there's lots of reasons that it works, and this is something we can help push our students to do and take advantage of. And interleaving, similarly, um, has to do with mixing up uh, problem types or category types, if that's the sort of material you're teaching. And here, too, it goes well against the grain of what students will tend to do on their own. Left to their own devices, well, I'm going to study, let's say it's statistics, I'm going to study all my t-tests, and I'm going to study all my ANOVAs, and now I'm going to study all the, uh, uh, my, the ways, my descriptive statistics. And we know that you're going to retain more if you practice by mixing all those in together. So I have to alternate between t-tests, ANOVAs, other concepts. All right? So these are applied memory findings that everybody should know about and we can start taking advantage of. And it's especially true with the testing effect. This is one that students tend to have very limited awareness of and very limited inclination to do on their own. All right? So, I mean, there's always a balance between teacher-driven and student-driven, more autonomous uh, approaches to learning. But I think that we do have to keep in mind that, for example, in this, in this uh, great survey that was done a couple years ago, when they just asked college students, you know, what would you prefer to do? If you've read a chapter already and you're going to take a test on it, what, we, what do you want to do with your study time? Most of them opted for rereading. They said, I want to go back over that chapter. Very few spontaneously said, you know, I think self-quizzing is a good way to go. Okay, so a couple takeaways before we kind of jump into what does technology bias. Uh, you know, so we need to get away from this idea that memory is like a holding tank. Think of it in that adaptive framework. It's a way for us to uh, gather and take in and encode goal-relevant information. And if you don't have attention, you're not going to get anywhere with students. Okay? Um, and this retrieval practice, this engaged, attentive practice, looks like a test feels a little bit like a test, uh, that's what's going to give you the payoff, all right? So those are, I think, some top takeaways from some of our research. And technology buys us this, right? So like with the testing effect, we've known that since I was in grad school. And I remember when I was, <laughs> came on the scene 16 years ago to walk into my first intro to psych class, I really wanted to take advantage of that. I wanted to be giving 
frequent opportunities for testing, for feedback, and I was looking at moving boxes full of pencil and paper quizzes. Okay? So uh, quite simply, when it's used in this planful way, we can do something we could never do before. I can now give unlimited, repeatable attempts at quizzes that I pull out of the publisher-supplied test bank. Students can take them to infinity and keep the highest grade, which is wonderful. There's no disincentive for taking the test anymore. In fact, we tell them even if you have 100%, keep going because taking the test is a good learning activity. Right? So that's a big one. Spacing and interleaving practice, similarly. Okay? So I remember when, uh, in some of the earlier days of online learning and even communication with email, faculty would say, oh my gosh, the students can, they can, they have access to us 24-7. Well, guess what? It runs the other way as well. So if we set the classes up that way, we can have students engaging, you know, on a Tuesday. We can have them turning in a different assignment on a Sunday. Even with that sort of deadly one day a week class schedule, that does not have to be kind of the minimal level of engagement for our students. So we can space and interleave practice more systematically than we ever could before. And we haven't talked about this um, too much here. It's a little bit bigger topic. But that aligning the material with the individual learner's existing knowledge and goals. Okay, so finding out what students already know and hooking into that. That's really, again, very difficult to do face to face, pencil and paper, and there are tools available to do that online. So I think that if we had to kind of really simplify and pull out a lot of things, what technology buys us on the memory realm, those are some of the biggest things. Uh, so, yeah, toolkit of really simple shortcut heuristics that we can have top of mind for ourselves and communicate to our faculty. We're looking for things that can help take advantage of memory research. Uh, simply asking students to respond. Remember, we need their attention. And it, you know, if it's intrinsic interest we've been managing to, uh, to incite in our students or, or other things, that's wonderful. But at the very least, we can design something like a sequence of information so that it, students are stepping up and having to answer. Because if you've ever like, been in that meeting where you get called on, nothing drives attention like having to respond. Mm -hmm. So simply designing in lots of targets for response is important. And this one I kind of have to apologize for because it's a little bit easier said than done. But I think it's, it's another that we're going to increasingly have to grapple with. Because especially um, as our learning environments are running in the, same, in the same space as Facebook and texting and all these other great electronic distractions, how do we hang on to that attention? So I think that this is something that we need to be more upfront with our students about, do more deliberate instruction and persuasion perhaps with them. Because, yeah, I, we can't even figure out if a chimney is missing if our attention is disrupted. Um, is the student going to learn OCHEM when they're texting three different friends and updating their profile at the same time? And maybe they got a cat video going on over here, right? <laughs> so we're all a little overly optimistic about attention. We don't really grasp that connection to memory. So a little bit more deliberate leading, maybe in order. All right, so a little step out here for a second. I just wanted to share with you, um, I guess I can call this an open educational resource. This is a module that my colleagues and I um, have, have uh, built at least a pilot version of at NAU. Um, it's a short one-shot module, takes about an hour for students to complete. And it uses demonstrations, uh, reflections, some quizzes with feedback to teach just some basic things, basic facts of, of life about, about memory. Disabuse them of the idea that they can sort of learn by osmosis um, and get them thinking about how they're going to plan to use their attention better and use their time better, consequently. So it's a module called Attention Matters. And uh, we do, again, have a, a very basic pilot version of this. And we have shared it out with a couple of intrepid volunteers. So we're waiting to hear back on how that, how that goes. All right. We need designs that harness the testing effect. I think that's clear. We're missing out um, on a lot if we don't use that. Build our courses to space study. Okay, So lots of low stakes assessments. Um, at NAU, in our first year learning initiative, for example, 
We require all classes to have some kind of low-stakes graded assessment in the first two weeks. It does a lot of things. Um, spacing study is one of them. It also sets a tone and an expectation that this is not a class where we you know, hang around for six weeks and then cram before the midterm. We can tell students that all day long, but if our course designs reflect that, we don't get very far. So encouraging space study, another huge one we can do. Try to figure out what students already know about an area before we start charging into teaching them something new about that. And here's a big one, of course, tying into what students care about. Getting back you know, to that mindset that we're going to try to adopt, that memory isn't this tank we throw things into, it's there to serve goals. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily mean catering to the individual interests and whims of every single individual student. Um, it does, however, uh, mean things like situating um, learning, ta learning tasks into bigger problems. Um, it can also mean, perhaps, those more public and open forms of learning like what we've seen uh, earlier today, such as blogging, right? It certainly ups the care factor quite a bit when you have something that's going to be shared and on display. Okay, so switching gears here over to the higher thought processes that I wanted to highlight for us today and demonstrate a few of them too. So when cognitive psychologists talk about higher thought processes, obviously it's a pretty broad umbrella term. But we mean things, among other things like categorizing, uh, formal reasoning, more informal problem solving, all that application stuff that's really, really important. And that we're aiming at um, as the final outcome for so many of our courses and learning experiences. So what I wanted to do is, once again, using some classic research as a base and a jumping off point, I wanted us to try to um, attempt a little reasoning task, right? We're all seasoned professionals. We sort of think for a living, in a sense. So we're going to try something. Um, so what I'm going to do is present you with a, a classic test called rule verification, all right? So I'm going to be giving you a rule, just a little statement. And you're going to have, your job is to figure out what kind of information would help you uh, tell if that rule is being followed or being broken. So here's a little illustration. This does have a, a little physical metaphor I need to play along with. So your rule here is if a card has an odd number on one side, it has an animal on the other side. We all know about numbers. We all know about animals. So that, that should be OK. Um, now, what you have to imagine you're looking at here is, let's say there's a set of cards, right? And there's something printed on each side of the card. And what you're looking at is the cards laid out on a table. And this is the information you get to see. And what you have to figure out here is which cards are even valuable to flip over? Which cards would help you tell if that task is, is uh, if that rule is being followed or not? And it might be tempting to just flip them all over and let the, let the chips fall where they may, but no, you have to be selective and figure it out. So I want you to kind of think about that for a second, reflect on how this attempt at reasoning kind of, kind of feels. So let's say over here we've got, we've got card number one showing an odd number. You might have a, have a feeling about whether you'd want to check that odd numbered card, right? And if, yeah, if you checked it, let's say you checked it and there wasn't an animal, that'd be really informative. Okay, great, great, doing all right so far. Here's a card that's showing an even number. Hmm. Hmm, now we're, most people will be like, I don't think so, but I'm not quite sure. And if we found out that this even number card had, a, had an animal on the other side, eh, it maybe doesn't seem so informative. Okay, here's a card with an animal. Should we check the other side? Now we're like, OK. <laughs> Most people here at this point are like, mm, I, I am not really sure which way to go on this one. Let's flip it over. It's a cow. It's got a four. I'm not sure. Well, here's one that does not have an animal. We could check it. All right, great. So if you're about 80% confused here, that's good. <laughs> that's where I would predict you would be. So, so that's hard. That's a hard reasoning task. Uh, so we'll give you another shot at it. So let's take this one. If a person is drinking alcohol, that person's over 21 years of age. Okay, role verification swings into action. 
Um, should we check a person if we know that they are drinking a beer? What do you think? Check their age? Yeah, go ahead and card the person who's drinking a beer. Makes sense. Right. What about a person who we know is drinking juice? Not a lot of point in checking how old that person is, right? Doesn't tell you one way or the other. We check somebody who we know is over 21. Do that. No, no, no. All right. What about the 19-year-old? Okay. <laughs> check their drink. All right. Ding, ding, ding. Exactly. So. Okay, are we, are we comfortable with saying that that second roll test was a little bit easier? A little bit easier? I saw a lot, at least more movement in the heads than I saw. I'll say that there are more correct answers. Um, the gimmick here is that this, they're the same. It's the same task mm -hmm. and the answers are the same. But we feel very, very differently about reasoning in those two contexts, don't we? So, hazard a guess about why? Why is that? Legality, okay, very good. Legality and practice, very good. Prior knowledge. And these are just about there. Now, notice what's not going on here is because you've memorized that specific rule. So people who've studied this, this type of test and this type of reasoning have found that what drives this, what really dramatically changes you from somebody who can't think into somebody who can, um, it's not because you have memorized a rule about alcohol and ages. There's something deeper going on. It's, it's actually called a permission schema. That's uh, a sort of contextual knowledge about situations in general where you have to fit um, a requirement in order to legally do something. Okay? And psychologists have been making hay out of this, uh, this effect it's, uh, for, for decades now. But I think one important thing that this shows us as teachers <laughs> is it just isn't as simple as saying, okay, here's the students who can think, and here's the students who can't. We'll teach the students who, who can't think. We'll move them over into this category, and voila, we have thinking. Now you've had a firsthand experience of what it's like to try to do higher thought processes in a context, in an arena, in which you're, you're simply not familiar, and you don't have a schema to grasp onto. Given a schema, you can. But without that, it kind of pulls the rug out from under you. So thinking is, is a tall order because of this context factor. Um, you know, another one of the big things that we face um, in teaching, big problem, is the problem of transfer. And there's some, not all, but there's some thinkers who've said maybe this is the key problem in education because what, after all, is education if not trying to get, you know, we're not trying to teach students to be better students. We want them to, to take what they learn in our courses and in their interactions with us into their jobs, into the next course, uh, into the ballot box. Those are, that's the real agenda we have. But time and again, the pattern in studies of thinking is that uh, thinking that happens in one context, reasoning that happens in one context, uh, doesn't jump over into the next. And you hear stories, for example, of, of physics professors who say, well, you know, we did all these problems. I was trying to teach them this principle in physics, and we looked at, you know, a speeding bullet. We looked at a rocket, and then I gave them a problem that was about an airplane. They said, we didn't study airplanes. We only studied bullets and <laughs> rockets. And that's not what you were trying to teach, right? There were underlying principles. So uh, transfer is almost always harder to achieve than we realize. And that really, that really limits us. And here's another one, which is that, you know, while I do believe that content knowledge complements thinking, that's great, one doesn't fall out of the other. And I think we sort of say that, but we teach as though this is true. I know this has been my biggest, that was my biggest struggle when I was a beginning teacher. To say, all right, I want, what I really want them to do, I want them to be able to think more like psychologists at the end of my course. Well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to teach them about all these research projects that other psychologists have done. That stuff's important, but it doesn't, at the end of the course, create the student who can now think like me. So those are some of the things that we, that we grapple with when we try to teach thought processes. So fortunately, there is kind of a usual suspect that crops up here 
And it can be helpful, I think, to refocus us and to start to advance students towards those transferable, deep thinking skills that we really, really want. And those are underlying structural elements of problems. Okay? So the stuff that doesn't change as the superficial details of problems and examples changes. So um, we can say that, but I think that it sometimes helps to have something a little concrete to know what's a structural element of a problem. So here's a really crude, really everyday um, one that I'll throw out to you. Uh, so this is, this is a problem. Um, here's, here's the details of it. So let's say that you are driving to your campus and you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get there because you have to go to a meeting of the Space Allocation Committee. You hate this committee. It, you don't like the people who run it. But it, it's important that you be there because you'll, you'll get some, um, some good space for your department. You'll be a hero. All right, so you're on your way. You're two miles away. Meeting starts in 20 minutes. You have an old forest green Toyota 4x4. It belches gray smoke, makes this horrible grinding noise, and it's a total stop. You've got $8 in your pocket. You have a cell phone, but it's a little low on batteries. So what do you do? All right? You walk. OK, very good. It's two miles. You would walk. But more importantly, what's important about that problem? Some of those details, some of those characteristics of the structure of what I gave you matter and others do not matter. So uh, I don't know, what are, what are just some, some key things that matter about that problem? How far away is it? Right. And the time. Time, the distance. Maybe the resources at your disposal. Right. What does it matter about that problem? <laughs> OK, you're not going to worry about the $8. You don't need the cash anyway. Anything else that doesn't matter about the problem? But you don't like the committee. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that may be in your mind. It's part of the situation. But you know, you know to drill down. You're kind of an expert at this sort of problem. So you're, you can sort right away. OK, what do I need to pay attention to to solve this? And what do I really need to suppress or get rid of on the side? Now, novices in an area, they may not know. They're like, oh my gosh, what color is the car? <laughs> how, many, you know, how much do I have in my pocket? And do I really like this person I sat next to? Uh, all that stuff gets in there and gets cluttered. But when we can force attention, we can train students to start drilling down to those elements. It helps with transfer. And it helps with more expert-like performance um, in those realms. And another area where this, this shows up is in critical thinking. Right? So critical thinking is, is a big one. This is a huge goal of what we do. So if you work with faculty, and you really get them talking about what do you want students to get out of this course, out of all your learning outcomes, many times this is the answer you get. I want them to be able to do critical thinking. But here's the catch is, have you ever asked them, what does that mean to you? All right? So let's throw it up into just a couple of examples about you know, possible definitions for critical thinking. And that's probably going to be pretty discipline specific. So what are some Ideas are words that might come up. Say, what do you mean by I want my students to have critical thinking? OK. Yeah, yeah. So definitely so there's a component of I want them to be able to process the next thing that comes down the pipe. OK. Yeah, what do you think? OK. So. Point of, point of view, objective versus subjective, maybe what's evidence, what's a uh, conclusion drawn from evidence. Okay, so that, yeah. Okay. Okay, all right, so the relationships uh, among elements in a problem, that's pretty broad. I mean, as a psychologist, I start to go off on things like, well, I want them to understand uh, correlation versus causation. I want them to be able to you know, understand the relationship between evidence and extraordinary claims like ESP. And, you know, I think that's okay. I think critical thinking is a, is a big umbrella term. There's a lot of variability in how we might define it across disciplines and even individuals. And that's fine. It just means that when we have those conversations with faculty about how do we target and build this, that's where it needs to start. Not with, okay, here's the solution to that, but what do you mean by critical thinking? So what 
So first of all is defining it. And then if you start, you really want to have a long conversation with your faculty, ask them what gets in the way. And here's a few highlights from uh, just some of the psychological literature on critical thinking. So here's where you realize, oh wow, this is not something that we're going to do the last week of class like I used to do, like, ooh, this is the critical thinking time. This is something, it is a very big, pushing a big boulder up a tall hill. So among other things, yeah, deep structure gets in the, if, when we fail to foreground that, it's hard to think critically. Uh, even if I were to present to my students, I could train them on the definition of correlation and causation all day long. But if, let's say I tell them, well, there's a new charter school in town, and it was shown at the end of the year that the charter school's test scores were higher than the public schools. Great, let's pour all the money into the charter schools. Well, I want them to see, oh yeah, that's one of those correlation and causation problems. Um, but uh, what they may get sidetracked onto is, oh, you know, my neighbor's daughter went to that charter school and it was great, or I really am opposed to you know, how we fund charter schools, and get sidetracked onto those things. So deep structure, deep structure, structural elements of problems, this can also drive critical thinking or conversely get in the way when we don't do it. We also know that critical thinking is not so much, not just a matter of being able to do something, but it's being willing to do it and knowing that it's time to do it. So we can shift in and out of critical thinking mode and students will, will do that. So they not only need practice in the how, they need practice in the when and the why. To be able to say, oh yeah, this, this charter school thing, it's another one of those problems. It's an effortful form of thought. It is a lot easier to go with you know, the anecdote and the subjective. Um, and sometimes we do actually have students who are, have motivations to maintain the, the less logical beliefs. So for example, believing in ESP might give a student a measure of a feeling of control in an uncontrollable world. So again, I can't just stand up and say, you know what, that's, that's an idea without evidence, and voila, it's gone. So critical thinking, if we want it to happen, there's a lot that we're going to have to address and a lot that we're going to have to have students practicing and doing. Um, all right, so moving ahead to takeaways in this area of, uh, of the higher thought processes. Okay? So, Reasoning, hopefully, you've seen and, and maybe taken to heart that this can be a very context-dependent thing, not a can you do it or not. I taught him to do it, so I'll always be able to do it. Um, it's supported by context knowledge, but it's still distinct from it. It needs to be tackled as a separate aspect of our teaching. Um, structural elements of problems is a good idea that crops up over and over as ways to address uh, everything from practical problem solving to critical thinking. And they've just got to have this abundant practice. And that is, as you, might, as you might guess, where technology can come in. Because this is something that allows us and enables us to create those multiple examples. Right? So um, I'll give you just, uh, just one from a, from a colleague of, uh, of mine that I've worked with a bit. She teaches electrical engineering. And she saw this and said, oh, I need students to practice some basic principles. Uh, I think Ohm's Law is one of them. Um, in her class, uh, and you, don't, you can't have them doing the identical or even very similar problems over and over and over. But she used her homework, uh, her homework system to generate long, uh, actually infinite, has lasted as long as the student was willing to keep practicing, um, examples with just different, uh, different seed numbers. So it could vary the specifics of the problem, but give them essentially the same problem as many times as they needed to master it. Um, and in a twist, we actually also had students time their practice. We told them we actually are looking at you getting faster at these as well as, as well as more accurate. So this is what students need. This is what technology buys us. So more options for requiring and reinforcing practice. So if you're not using the technology or your faculty are not fully exploiting that affordance of technology, I think they're missing out. So more ways to require and reinforce practice. It gives us options for very systematically presenting problems. So, for example, in uh, some types of mathematics instruction, students really need to see the correspondence between uh, different types of problems. Say, aha, uh -huh, you can map this step here over onto this step here. So there's a similar sequence, and you can apply one and flow it over to the other. 
Well, you know, we can some, we, sometimes we end up scrolling that on the board in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, in, a, in an online environment, we can do things like create more sophisticated multimedia, maybe even, say, a narrated diagram or an animation that shows those steps unfolding. And the students can present back to themselves as many times as they need or want to do. So practice, systematic presentation of problems, and opportunities for that reflection and deliberation that helps drive critical thinking. So to support critical thinking, we have to get students practicing, uh, focusing on not just again, the right answer or the what or the end point, but the why. Why do you believe that? How did you get to that answer? Right? So as many people have observed, things like online discussion uh, really privilege this type of reflection and deliberation in a way that a face-to-face -face, face environment just does not. So in those face-to-face -face environments, they have a lot of good things about them, but they do tend to privilege the students who are quick on the draw, who can respond very, very quickly, and who are extroverted, very outgoing. Uh, online, we can push it out to the students who are a little bit more introverted and need a little bit more time to respond and make it clear that that's what we expect. That's what technology buys us. So the heuristics that we want to send our faculty away with. Assigning students to practice the thinking skills you want them to have. This might seem like a throwaway statement, but linger on it for just a second. I mean, first of all, it's really two things. The thinking skills you want them to have. Many times we charge into the content of a course without really dissecting that part of the problem, right? So we don't say, what thinking skills do I want them to have? Defining that and then saying, all right, where does the learning time go? Where are the learning activities in this course? And how can we match one of those to the other? We can strengthen our teaching tremendously if we do this. Setting up those varied, realistic scenarios for reasoning. So uh, this doesn't mean that there has to be animation or even a complex cover story. But especially if you want students to take uh, their thinking skills out into an applied environment, that's the type of field you're in. That's where students' learning time needs to go. So uh, for example, uh, Kearney, Kearney Mellon's got, uh, has generated yet another great resource. Um, with, uh, that allows students to um, simulate some laboratory processes such as uh, what they might want to do in a social science. So it allows them to uh, look at simulated sets of data, um, generate new sets of data under different parameters, and use those to test hypotheses. That's the sort of thing I want them to be able to do, um, but I'm really going to fall short if they only do it, say, in a senior capstone project at one time. So we need to look for things that allow us to, to set up those scenarios for reasoning and to vary those so that, again, we are focusing on that deep structure. And exploiting discussion. This was a big one that, that I learned in my career uh, going into online teaching. Online discussions, to people who aren't familiar with them, they look like chit-chat. Oh, you know, hey, I totally agree. And people say, are you really giving students credit for this? I can't believe it. But research on this has tended time and again to really show that from a critical thinking standpoint, that's where a huge amount of the, with the weight of the class is going. So these pull a lot of weight when it comes to building those thinking skills. So it's well worth really looking at what are our discussion assignments asking for? Are they, again, aligned with the thinking skills we want them to have? And really pushing students into them. Um, I know in, in uh, one of the research projects we did at NAU, the best predictor of students' final grade in uh, our cognitive psychology online course was how many times they posted in the discussion forum. Obviously a very crude measure, but that says a lot. Since I would configured things, so the grade, uh, really very little part of the grade was even coming from the discussion. So we were able to separate out. They weren't just earning a lot of points by posting, but there was something going on when they were engaged in that type of activity online with their, with their peers. So these are things that we can all do. Um, and these are things that we can use to start to draw faculty into the types of learner-centered centered pedagogies and the types of tools that we really want them to have in, in their courses. So 
closing thoughts, just a couple of things that I think are, are out there on the future as we want to start aligning what we do more closely uh, with the cognitive sciences and other sources of important evidence um, in learning. So just like a lot of, uh, a lot of our other speakers at this, at this event, um, I think that this learning that lives outside of courses, as I would put it, or you can call it uh, micro-modules, nano-learning, uh, there is nothing in cognitive sciences or cognitive psychology that privileges the 15-week the course model. I agree, like a lot of other people, that this is an artifact and a, and a holdover of other you know, institutional structures. So I think something like Attention Matters uh, is an example. That's something where we focused on trying to teach a limited set of learning objectives um, and to do so in a way that was largely discrete and didn't have to follow exactly right before uh, or after any other type of material. So I think we are going to see more of those. I think in order to use principles like these, we're going to have to continue the trend toward collaboration, this team approach. OLI, the, the Open Learning Initiative, obviously is a very, very high level, ambitious example of this in action with a giant team of instructional designers and subject matter experts. But even in the environments most of us actually work in, um, we can keep pushing for these. Um, you know, one of my colleagues took the, my uh, full cognitive psych uh, online cognitive psychology course. She said she thought she needed it to be a more effective teacher. And while that was great, that is not something that is practical um, for all of us to do. But as learning designers, we can, we, you can be the bridges between the subject matter and the design. So we're going to see more people using that as a, as a matter of course. Um, I have a little phrase up here, flipping the textbook. We'll see if you guys want to kick that one around a little bit. Uh, I think the more we go into this, the more we all realize, of course, that content is cheap. It's not about delivering the content anymore. What's beginning to be extremely critical in courses are the resources that allow us to do things like set up repeated testing and immediate feedback or simulate a laboratory task uh, online. Those things, it's great if they come from the publishers, but those can't be an afterthought. And I think that, that our publishers have been a little slow to adapt to this new reality where more and more of us really need high quality ancillaries and the textbook is more, the textbook content is, is more the afterthought. So maybe we'll start to see a, a shift there with more of us demanding high quality resources like that packaged with our materials if we're still using a non-open format. Um, I think that more of us are also going to be increasingly pushing to get away from the slideshow plus quiz format that really a lot of online instruction still looks like. So I think, you know, slideshows can be good, they can be narrated well. Um, but I really think that we're going to start to push out from that because this does not do a lot of these other things, especially in the realm of higher thought processes. And lastly, yeah, <laughs> lastly, here's the thing. We can keep filling up journals uh, with research findings till the end of time. We can keep inventing incredibly sophisticated and ideally even open resources uh, for us to use in our teaching. But if faculty are not adopting them or ideally even clamoring to use those things, they may as well not exist. So I really think the future belongs to those of us who can not only kind of start to incorporate these things or take them to heart, but can bring them out to the people who are actually working with the students who can spread those innovations throughout a community, throughout the people that we work with. That's what I, I think is sort of the next jumping off point to the next big project in creating more powerful teaching and learning experiences. All right, well, thank you very much. Is there any questions? Any questions for Michelle? I know it's the end of the day, okay. Wait, wait, Maureen, hang on. That student memory module that you had up there, I, yeah. I would really be interested in, in right. adding that as, as a little one hour thing. I'm always trying to sort of get that through to my students in the classroom and online. So I would be interested in, in uh, learning how we can do that. So. All right. Well, uh, you know, right now it's, it's email. Just 
Kind of an old technology, but, yes. but email me. We do have it archived in a couple of different formats, and I also have it kind of in a big disaggregated form that you can build any way you like in your, in your own LMS. Wonderful. I'll be glad to give feedback or whatever. So Great. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Linda. Um, this isn't a question. I just wanted to um, let you know that just before I came here, a faculty member yeah. gave me a zip file with the attention, attention Matters unit in it and asked me, please help me figure out okay. how to get this into my course. Right. So, you know, at least in Troy, they're, they're listening. All right. Okay. And I do. I have, uh, I have some uh, IT help on my, on my team, so we can definitely work individually and get that working. Yeah. He says he understood it. He all. understood it all. Good. Well, we, we had a chance to work all the kinks out last night at so, <laughs> dinner. Okay. All right. So um, thank you very much, Michelle. Really You're appreciate welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. On my last slide. Um, so we are going to take a break. Um, I think there's coffee and stuff out there. We have two more presentations this afternoon, so um, please don't go too far. Um, and we'll be starting, um, we are running a little bit late, but um, we'll be starting up back up, I think, in about 10 minutes, if, if that would be okay uh, with everyone. Thank you. Thank you.